Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming today. I know that San Francisco has a much more exciting uh, thing going on right now, but I believe you, you won't be disappointed uh, that you spend some time with us today. And we have here uh, Jakov Krolo, who is uh, just starting as an intern uh, in New York City. And we have Ivan Zhuzak, who had his internship uh, with the Gadgets team uh, not so long ago and made some uh, impressive contributions to the team at the time when he was here. Uh, he, they launched the Intragadget Communication API, the first, the first version of it. So uh, they're going to be talking today about something uh, they've been working and which is supported by the Google University Grants Program. They proposed uh, an extension of some of the work uh, they've been doing uh, with the Gadgets team. And you know, like the background of this is sort of interesting. You know, like if you, if you, if you became a programmer as a kid, like I did, not in university, not in high school, but really early, then you know, like grasping some computer concepts, it's not actually trivial. And the idea of you know, like having a lot of users uh, using computers goes actually back all the way to Charles Babbage and actually Ada Lovelace, who envisioned a world where you know, like a lot of people will use these thinking machines and mesh with them you know, like in a lot of different ways. Uh, later on, Turing said something to the contrary. He veered into a direction because he had practical machines to work with. Uh, well, no, not really. I mean, there's going to be a casty of programmers and then a lot of people feeding these machines. Uh, I think the pendulum may be swinging, swinging back because of the advances, the, the you know, like major advances in technology in the last decades. And I think we're you know, like about to maybe enter a world where uh, programming and mashing up things and coming with new applications for computers, the barrier for that may be lowered you know, like to, to Eat mer mortals, as uh, some of us would say. I think uh, I think that's a pretty interesting uh, idea. You know, like what you will see today is perhaps the first scratch of it. There will be a demo, but I think uh, I think it goes in the right direction. And I think these guys and Professor Srblic, who is leading the whole team uh, at the University of Zagreb would really value your feedback of, you know, like, how do you see this, you know, like, and what direction this should be taking. So let me stop here and give the floor to these guys. Please welcome them. Okay, thank you all for sabotaging the Google I.O. event in San Francisco and coming here to listen to us. So my name is Ivan Zhuzak. Uh, with me are Jakov Krolo, Professor Srbic, and Ivan Gavran from the University of Zagreb. Uh, that's in Croatia, a small and unknown country in Europe. And today we're going to talk about uh, end users developing gadgets. And maybe it's not interesting to people that don't develop gadgets, but you can see it as an extension in the near future for developing web pages. So. Let's get rolling. So our team in Zagreb has eight full-time full PhD students with, led by Professor Srbic, and we had a lot of experience with Google and other companies. Most of us have been interns in Google in various teams like Gadgets, Rosetta, and Checkout, and Tricks. And Professor Srbic has a lot of experience in the Silicon Valley. He was working at uh, at and Bell Research Labs, uh, UC Irvine, Uni University of Toronto. We had cooperation with Cisco and Ericsson. Also, we have two Google Research Grants awards for two of our projects, uh, one of which I'm going to talk about today, the first one. And the second one is the Unified Translation Memory Project, which is about developing a open source distributed translation memory system. Oops. So we started this research about five, ye five years ago. And it started with experimenting with service-oriented architectures. And we developed uh, two systems named Pi and Husky, which we presented here in Google a few years ago. And these are, these are service-based uh, service composition environments. And from that, we moved on to gadgets and end users uh, developing gadgets. And we, we received a reward for our research and talk about it today. 
So before we give the demo, uh, we want to talk about the motivation behind our research. Why is it important to let end users develop gadgets? What are the problems and what are the possibilities of this? Uh, and after the demo, we want to uh, leave some time for Q&A. So most of you have probably used gadgets as those little web pages you can put, put on other web pages. You have calendars, adver advertising, maps, pregnancy countdown tickers, and stuff. And in just a few years, gadgets have been around just for years, uh, these gadgets have become extremely popular. You can have them on any web page. Uh, they have more than hundreds of thousands of gadgets and more than thousands of millions of users and billions of pages every week. But is just looking at the raw numbers uh, enough? Because Facebook has a lot of growth lately. They have a lot of applications, but as you can see from these numbers from O'Reilly, uh, they have really uneven distribution of users over these gadgets. So it's a very unbalanced thing. And just looking at these numbers, you, you probably can't tell if this is good or bad. And for whom is it good or bad? For the users, for, the, for Facebook or something? And we can help ourselves by looking back and learning from our experience with companies like Google, Amazon, and eBay. And the thing they learned is uh, something that Chris Anderson called the long tail. And this theory explains that there is a huge value in providing access to low popular products. And you can see this in the example from Amazon, where they don't make money just from selling the top 20% best sellers. They make a lot of money from selling a lot of unpopular books to a lot of people. So for example, Boris could be interested in uh, air guitars or skydiving or something or other. But there's a lot of you buying that stuff that's interesting just for you. And this experience tells us that if we extend the long tail, we could create a new market for these gadgets, which would be more interesting to attract different kinds of people and make happier users because they're finding the gadgets they want, like buying a book that you want for air guitar or skydiving or something like that. And happier users means you can find a, you can probably find a way to monetize this attention, whether through markets invitation or something. So we just need to figure out who will develop all these gadgets in the long tail, because we know who will develop the best gadgets. You can't let the, someone without programming skills develop calendar gadgets or mail gadgets. This is sensitive stuff. But the long tail gadgets have a possibility to be developed by end users. So up until now, only developers have been developing gadgets using HTML and JavaScript, and end users don't know that. But if we could find a way to, to let end users develop gadgets, there could be a huge opportunity in this. So first of all, there is a lot, of, a lot more of end users than professional developers. And although they don't know HTML, JavaScript, Java, C++, or something like that, uh, they have some specific domain knowledge, vertical knowledge, which they can use to create better gadgets like financial gadgets, or bookstores gadgets, or air guitar gadgets, or something. And even, they, even, even if they don't have this knowledge, they can personalize or customize these gadgets for themselves. And this is just the, the majority of the long tail gadgets which tell us that these gadgets are not used by a majority of users, but they are used by a small number of users, and there's a lot of them, because there's a lot of you. The users, the, the consumer market is huge for these long tail gadgets. And if we make this process simple and easy, you get disposable gadgets, which means uh, you can create a gadget just for one purpose and throw it away when you're done. It's, it should be that simple to, to make gadgets. And you get instant gratification for free, which means you don't have to wait for a developer to develop these gadgets. And if we want to develop all, the, all these long tail gadgets, we need to make building gadgets as simple as using gadgets. And this is because end users only know how to use gadgets. They don't know how they work. They don't know what the infrastructure behind them is. They only know how to click a button, enter a text in a text box. So this is the challenge. And Google does have something like this. They have the iGoogle Gadget Maker, which is a programming-free, form-based environment for creating gadgets. So you can create a predefined set of gadget types, like uh, photo albums, countdown gadgets, just by entering like a URL to your Picasso web album, and you get a gadget in just a few seconds. But with this, you get only predefined types of gadgets, and 
you're wondering, at least we were wondering in Zagreb, if we can do something better, if we can improve this process and get something more than just predefined gadgets. So we're thinking about how do end users perceive gadgets or web pages or ger general uh, web services. And they're, they perceive this, this uh, web service through this gadget, through the interface of the gadget. And developers know that behind this web service stands an API, which they use to create this user interface, which the end users use. But the end users know only about the uh, UI. And through this metaphor, you can, you can understand that end users perceive this UI as the product, as the gadget. So uh, using uh, actions, uh, using interface actions, these actions are actually the language which end users perceive as the API for, for gadgets or for web pages generally. And this is the idea with which, with which we started uh, Gepetto, which is our environment for developing gadgets. And this is, it was actually a quest for finding knowledge in end users, which they already have, and making them use this knowledge to create gadgets in an easy way. So not making them learn something new, like programming or threads or synchronization mechanisms. And this quest led us, uh, led us to four basic questions. How are gadgets generally created? How do we define an interface for these gadgets? How do we define the logic behind gadgets? And is there a need to define uh, time ordering relations in these gadgets. So I'll just lead you through the key decisions in our methodology. So in Geppetto, uh, we use gadget composition as a general methodology for developing gadgets. And this means you start off with a few elementary gadgets, uh, which you already have on, let's say, on your iGoogle page. So you have a few existing gadgets, and you compose them into a new gadget, which you call the composite gadget. So you start out with a few gadgets, you end up with a composite gadget. And first off, you need to create an interface for this gadget. And the easiest thing to, easiest thing to do for the end user is to uh, create the interface by reusing elements of the interface from existing gadgets. So you just pick some elements from the uh, existing gadgets, and you drag and drop into a new blank gadget, which you start off. So you define the interface using elements from existing gadgets. And now you need to define the logic of the uh, created gadget. And here is where we use this idea that the language which end users understand is the language of interface actions over the user interface of gadgets or web pages. So for example, uh, wait for a click, click a button, copy paste data from text box or something like that. So let me just give you an example. So let's say you want to wait for a button click on a gadget. So the end users understand this just as I said it wait for a click. So we use this language in our methodology to write something like this. And this means wait for someone to click the go button at this gadget. So the syntax may be not the most appropriate for, for end users, but you, you can imagine a better abstraction for the syntax or maybe images or icons for this. But underneath, this is what's, what's going to be going on. Also, let's say you want to copy paste some data from a text box to another text box in another gadget. This is what the end user sees or perceives mentally. So we want to transfer this in, in a sentence or a statement like this. Stock price from this gadget, transfer it to stock price at destination gadget. It should be a really close match to the mental idea of the end user, what's going on. And let's say the user wants to click a button, you say, click go button at some gadget. And that's it. And we, can't, we came to, the, to a question where we wanted to, which we wanted to answer. And this question was, do we, do we, do we need to order these events in time? So we, we defined some events, like click a button, copy paste some data, et cetera. But is there a need to say something should happen before something else? Is this something that end users need to define? And if you think about it, there is actually a need to do this. Let's say you have a finance gadget which buys and sells stocks. And you want, you want to buy some stock before selling some other stock. There is no way, or it's extremely hard, to, uh, to let the computer guess this is going to happen before something else. Because you can't guess it from the data flow, from the data. And this is something that I know as a developer 
uh, in my mental process for defining this gadget. So there is a need to the, let end users define time ordering between these events. And the only challenge is how to present this visually to end users so it is simple enough for them to use. And this is because they don't know threads or synchronization mechanism or something. And what we came to is that end users know only about two types of uh, ordering in time. And this is, first is uh, sequential events. So we know that something happens before or after something else. And independence, which means that event A can happen in any order of event B. And this is all you need. And this is all that end users perceive. And what we do in Geppetto is organize these events in a grid layout. And this grid, time flows from left to right and from top to bottom. And if you want to have sequential events, you put event A above event B if, if it should happen before event B. Or you put it left of event which should happen after. If you want to have independent events, you put them separately uh, with blank cells between them. So event E is independent of event F, but event C is before event D. When you organize your logic in this grid, you get a sequence of, uh, you get a set of sequences. And what this means is event A1 happens before event A2 and before event A5, but event A1 and C1 are independent, so they can go, they can execute parallelly. So these sequences are independent. And what you can see also from this grid is it's not cluttered with connectors. In most uh, layouts you use on the web, you'll see a lot of uh, graphical styles which use connectors, which become rather complicated for users when it starts to scale up. And this is the whole process of defining a gadget. So we started with a composite gadget, which is blank. You pick a set of elementary gadgets or existing gadgets which you'll use in your composite gadget. You pick a set of uh, interface elements. You drag and drop into your composite gadget. And then you define your events through this grid. And that's it. You have a new gadget. Now before we give the demo, I'll just show you a bit of internals, so how this works when you put a gadget on a page. How does it execute? So you have a program, a set of events you defined. And what we did is we implemented an engine which we put in the composite gadget in the new gadget you created, which executes this program. So what, what happens is uh, this engine reads this program and interprets this events and executes it by calling methods on these gadgets. So it, it reuses the functionality of the elementary gadgets to achieve its functionality. So let me just show you what this means. So the purpose of this composite gadget is to, you enter a stock symbol like Goog or Yahoo or Microsoft, and you fetch the stock price from the Google Finance gadget, and you, sh and you fetch the, a, a mini chart showing the stock history from the mini chart gadget and you display it on your new gadget. So we start off by saying, okay, wait for someone to click the go button on this gadget. So the engine blocks until the user clicks the button. So when the user clicks the button, we have a statement which transfers the entered stock symbol to the elementary gadgets. So we said, okay, let's fetch the Goog stock. We say to the composite gadget that we want it to click the go and add buttons so it can fetch the data from uh, the back end. So the existing gadget is refreshed, and the, the last thing we need to do is to fetch this data to the composite gadget. And we fetch just the stock price and the mini chart. And that's how it works. And now Yak will give the demo. Hi, my name is Jakov, and I'll give the demo. But uh, before I, we show you a live demo, we'll give you a short preview of the next version of our tool. So this first part is not yet fully implemented, but it gives an idea how simple it will be to create gadgets. Uh, we have impl implemented Geppetto to work on iGoogle. So what you can see here is uh, Google Finance Gadgets tab. And we want to create our own gadget out of these finance gadgets. So first, we click Add Stuff, and 
a new empty composite gadget. <coughs> uh, okay, uh, so this new empty composite gadget has two buttons, design and show hide. Design starts the process of creating a gadget and show hide hides the elementary, ga elementary gadgets we use and shows only the composite gadget. So let's create a new gadget out of these two gadgets, Google Finance and Mini Charts. Uh, drop down menu is shown which will guide you through the process. So first thing we have to do is define uh, the interface of the new composite gadget. We do that by drag and dropping the elements on elementary gadgets. So we drag and drop text box, go button, stock price text element from the Google Finance gadget, and chart from the mini charts. Okay, so we defined the interface, and now we have to define the logic of this new gadget. That is what the gadget does. We want that uh, when the user clicks the go button, the stock quote from this text box on the composite gadgets is transferred to text boxes on elementary gadgets. The stock price and stock chart are refreshed, and the results are shown on the new composite gadget. Okay, so let's define the logic. First, uh, we click the Go button, which creates a sequence of actions for this element. Uh, you can see the sections here to the right. And um, first action added is a click, uh, wait for click action. After that, we can add some other actions like uh, read, write, or click action. Uh, first, we add a read, write action, which uh, reads the stock quote from the text box on the composite gadget and transfer it to the text box on the Google Finance gadget. And there you can see action added to this actions list. After that, we add a click action that clicks the go button, which refreshes the stock price element. And uh, lastly, read write, which reads the new refreshed stock price and uh, transfers it to the composite gadget. So that's, uh, we can click finish because we defined how the stock price is uh, refreshed, and now, can we, now we can do the same with stock chart. So we click wait for click action, we add read write, which reads the stock quote, transfers it to the mini charts, click action, which clicks add, that refreshes the stock chart, and read write, which reads the refreshed stock, stock chart and writes it here to the composite gadget. And that's it. So. As you can see, it will be that simple to create new gadget. And uh, now we're going to show you a live demo. So this first part is, uh, is not yet it's not yet fully implemented, but uh, it gets it gives you an idea how simple it will be. So uh, this is the live demo of what what we have accomplished so far. Uh, we can try it. So. For example, let's let's write General Electrics. Go. And uh, should get. Okay, something is not going good with cookies, so I'm gonna log in again. Okay, I Google page. We have a composite gadget called Demo 1. It loads elementary gadgets that we use. Get us GUI. Hope it now should be all okay. So let's find out info about st Google stocks. Okay, so this stock quote, quote was transferred to these text boxes on elementary gadgets and we pick up the refreshed uh, values for stock price and stock chart to this composite gadget. Uh, we can hide these elementary gadgets with show hide button, so, which is nice if, if, we, if we have more elementary gadgets. Um, we can test it with Yahoo stocks. Hmm. Um, something is not going well, but it worked just a few seconds ago. Okay, so uh, let's try, let's go to the editor. Uh, we click on the design button when, uh, when we want to edit or design a new gadget. So this editor consists of three screens with sheets and a form for loading and saving gadgets. 
So this first sheet defines uh, the list of uh, gadgets that we use. This is the logical name for elementary gadgets we used. <coughs> we use, and this is the URL to its specification. Uh, this uh, logical name we, uh, we use it to reference uh, stock, uh, GF stock info. We use uh, to reference the uh, finance gadget and GF chart, uh, the mini charts gadget. We will need that uh, when we when we want to define the logic of the gadget. Second sheet is uh, where we define the elements on the interface of this new composite gadget. Uh, we use the HTML attribute title, which is nice because when we, when we mouse over the element, it, gets, it pops up the title. So uh, we will use text box uh, with the title symbol on finance gadget, uh, button go, and the uh, price element also from the finance gadgets and the chart from the mini charts. The third sheet is Geppetto program, the logic, uh, what the gadget does. Uh, at this moment, uh, we need to fill this uh, sheet manually, but as you've seen in the next version, uh, it will be the automatic uh, by point and click on the interfaces, elements on the uh, interface of the gadget. So we have a sequence of actions here. Uh, uh, each action executes after the previous one if we want them to be ordered. So, but uh, if, uh, as Ivan said, some actions don't need to be in any order, so it can be, they can execute in any order, so we can write them anywhere we want. So for example, we can split this sequence in two parts. Uh, the first part will be, will be related to refreshing the stock price and the other one to refreshing the stock chart. So I'm gonna show you how this works. We define another sequence, which also waits for the click on the go button. Uh, then the stock quote is transferred to the chart. We click the button which refreshes the chart. And the result, uh, we take, back the, we take back, back the result to the composite gadget. So now, we have two sequences, which will do exactly the same. But, okay, we need to save it, for example, demo two. We close the editor, come back to iGoogle. Now this composite gadget loads its elementary gadgets. Uh, we use the same gadgets. Uh, we only wrote the program in another way. We can test it with, for example, General Electrics. Um, and now uh, we, we can also add another uh, gadget. Uh, if, for example, if we want this price in euros and not in dollars, so. We should add some currency converter. Uh, we can call it CC. We need URL to this gadget. Okay, this is the URL. We don't need any elements on GUI. We can use the same as before. But now, um, when the price is refreshed on the finance gadget, we don't transfer it to this composite gadget, uh, but we transfer it to the input at CC, this new gadget. Uh, then we click uh, the convert convert button on this new currency converter. And the new value from CC to text element on composite gadget.
this is the key this is the keyword for the composite gadget hmm? okay yes click we can call it demo tree we close it have here some simple currency converter, some gadget that's not Google's. And we can test it. For example, Yahoo. So this value stock price, 20, it's not here 27.16, it's the price in Euro 17.55. And that's it, that's a demo, of, a live demo of what we have accomplished so far. And now even we'll give you a conclusion about Gepetta. Okay, before going on, I just want to mention that all of this uh, designing the new gadget, this will be done automatically in the next version. So filling out these three sheets will be done by clicking on the UI of the iGoogle page. And this will be more user friendly. So, so this may be a lot of uh, resemblance with mashups. You see that we mash data from a lot of gadgets, but this is not our intention with which we started this project. And the idea is to create a tool which end users can use to create gadgets or maybe in the future web pages. And you have a lot of these tools on the, on the web, but we wanted to create a tool which would be end user friendly and end user developer friendly. And for us, this means that the tool should satisfy a set of criteria which we uh, define through our research of uh, both both cognitive and uh, uh, computer sciences, and I'll just go uh, briefly through through them. And most of our, uh, most of these tools are based on blocks. So you have a, a lot of blocks of uh, existing functionality which you use to create new blocks. And what we think is important is that end users already understand or know are familiar with these blocks. Like in the case of gadgets, you don't introduce new abstractions for elements. They use you use existing elements. What is also important is that these blocks are self-contained, which means that they can use these blocks outside the environment which they use to develop the block. So for example, I can take the gadget out of the iGoogle page or out of, our, out of our environment and put it on some other page and use it there. Also, it's very familiar to end users to reuse applications which they built in further building new applications. And for using the same method, the same metaphor for uh, using gadgets and wiring them together. So if you can achieve uh, a metaphor for wiring gadgets together the same as using the gadget, this would be very good for end users. And what we did in Geppetto is using uh, the user interface actions to wire these uh, gadgets together. Um, it'll be uh, really simple for end users if you don't have different kinds of wiring elements uh, depending on the type of gadgets or number of gadgets you use. So for example, if you use a map gadget, you have uh, some set of actions you can do. And if you use a finance gadget, you have some other uh, set of actions you can do. It's really complicated. You just have to, you need to have a finite, finite state of uh, basic actions which end users can use and learn and reuse again and not have to learn new ones after they want to use some other gadget. What I think is really important in Geppetto is to have end users define their time ordering of the process they have defined cognitively in their mind and just put it on the spreadsheet we use. And last, uh, we want to have full scale viable construct constructability, which means uh, not limit the users to a finite state of things they can do with the wiring elements. We just want to let them do whatever they want. In the future, we want to work. Uh, mostly of all on our interface, make it more humor-centered, and work on gadget-to-gadget -gadget data management, which means if you want to transfer some data from different elements, like from a text box to a label, a text box to a table or a span, we don't want to burden the end user with, with conversions. We want to do this automatically. And in terms of research, we want to uh, tie our research together with cloud computing and specifically uh, research how this could be uh, 
execute scalably in the cloud, uh, research what is what are the problems of co content ownership and advertising. For example, if you have two gadgets uh, mashed up in a new gadget and you use the data from the existing gadgets, there's a question of ownership of this data. You don't know who owns the data. Am I using Boris's data? Does he let me use his data? What if I'm making money from his data? It's, a, it's an un unresolved issue. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Yes. Oh. Uh, this is going to be public, so let's keep the confidential kind of questions uh, for the end of the session. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, do the elementary gadgets have to be present once the composite gadget is created? Uh, they, they are present, but they're not visible. You can hide them, but they have to be present since the, uh, oh, sorry. So the question was, if the elementary gadget should be present uh, on the page with the composite gadget? So the answer is yes, because we, we reuse the functionality of the elementary gadgets to achieve the functionality of the composite gadget. So the elementary gadget provide the computation power for our composite gadget. I'm sorry. Right, we can hide it on the UI so the end user doesn't have to be burning with all the gadgets and the interface isn't cluttered with all the gadgets. Yeah, go ahead. What if the um, user wants to do simple calculations which results from a bunch of gadgets? Because uh, like in the example, um, you know, you, you had all the elementary gadgets doing all the work. Right. But, but let's say, um, uh, the user wanted to get results from two elementary gadgets and then have those results together to display. So, so you want to do computation inside the grid? Yeah, or yeah, inside okay. of the... So the question was if we can do, if we can uh, fetch data from different elementary gadgets, for example, currencies or uh, some data, and you want to uh, compute this data without uh, sending it to another gadget. Yeah, well, you can't do that. Uh, so the, the the premise is that uh, the the grid is used only for the layout of the events you want to write, and you reuse only the gadgets for to provide the computation for the composite gadget. Because using this, this would be uh, really like a spreadsheet. You want to integrate some spreadsheet functionality into the grid, and this is uh, a lot of users know this because they use spreadsheets, but a lot of, a lot of users don't, and we think that the same functionality you would want to provide in the spreadsheet, in the layout, could be provided as a separate gadget which you could use to composite the new gadget. So we want to keep it simple in the, in the layout. Yeah, go ahead. So you say time goes both down and to the right in that grid. Uh, this seems like users are going to want to make branches. What happens if they do that? Like I'd want to put one wait for click and make those two sequences that were demonstrated right. one going down and one going right. So let me go back. <laughs> I'll repeat the question. So the question was, what if we want to do branching in the, in the spreadsheet, or if we want to, so, so let's say event A1 had another event on its right, right? So we actually will want to do this in the next version, and this would be a perfect uh, example of branching, like you said. And this is uh, really simple for, for end users to do, and what would, what would happen is, event A1 would execute, and after it, event A2 and the event on the right would execute, execute after it. So uh, this, is, this is really simple to understand, but we want to take it step by step because it's really sensitive to know what end, us end users can perceive as, as a branch, because end users don't, don't know this as a branch, and they, they don't know variables, they don't know functions, whiles, or fors. It's, it's really a sensitive work. But yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be happen in the future. Okay. Anymore. Yeah, the execution engine actually has it. Yep, go ahead. So have you actually done any work to prove that any of these features that you talked about, like uh, properties of like addition or you know, string decantation or something, are easier for you? perceive as separate gadgets than directly as language features? Uh, so the question was if we, it was uh, the same question as. Right. Is that actually easier for users to understand than having an addition operator in the language? Uh, 
uh, yeah, we, we think it may be because some, some users don't know spreadsheets. They don't know, they'll have to learn the functions for it. So they have to learn the syntax and the, the statements for writing add, uh, multiply, or something else. But if they have the gadget, which they know what does, like a calculator gadget, they know what it does. And it's really simple to reuse this, this knowledge for them. How do you define the boundary between language features and gadget features? I, I, you have a quick operator in your language. Yeah, so, so the question is, how do we define the boundary between the language features and the gadget features? So we want to keep the language for defining the logic uh, as simple as possible, which means uh, no computation in it. So we don't want to add uh, addition, multiplication in the language. We just want to keep the, the computation in other gadgets. Right. Any more questions? Okay, I think that's it. Thank you for coming. We hope to see you again.